Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning. Our opening hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's worship together. Your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church, and because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Sechem and summoned the elders and heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, 
Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did the great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will forgive your transgressions for your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witness against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and put in place the statutes and rules for them, etc. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you have I put my trust. O my soul, you have said unto the Lord, You are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. All my delight is upon the saints who are on the earth, and upon those who excel in virtue. But those who run after another God shall have great trouble. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, neither make mention of their names with my lips. The Lord himself is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You shall maintain my law. The boundaries have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will thank the Lord for giving me counsel. My heart also chastens me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, therefore I shall not fall. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For you shall not leave my soul in the grave. Neither shall you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You shall show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand there is pleasure forevermore. reading from the New Testament is from the Paul's letter to the Ephesians and I'm beginning to read at the third at the 15th verse I'm sorry of chapter 5 look carefully then how you walk 
not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whenever good, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their masters and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. And this is the word of the Lord. John. 
many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. I'll be seated. My text for this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 uh, to 33. But before we attend to the word of the Lord, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that this morning you would apply this word to our hearts. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This morning we're looking at the second half of Ephesians chapter 5, but to truly grasp what the Apostle Paul teaches us in these verses, we need uh, to rewind just a bit 
and head back to Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And now here's the main point. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So here, Paul is calling uh, the Christians in Ephesus, and indeed he's calling every other Christian who reads this letter, to live a life of holiness and purity. Paul is encouraging his readers to turn away from and to disengage from all that is sinful, harmful, impure, and evil. And he's encouraging his readers to turn towards and to engage with all that is holy, beneficial, pure, and good. Paul delivers his call to the church using the terms of the old life and of the new life. Last Sunday, Paul, or sorry, Father Darrell, taught on life, the life that God offers us. And the title that I've given to this sermon is Learning to Live the New Life. And so Jesus has given us this new life, but the question is, well, now we have to live it. And so how do we do that? Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 22, put off your old self. And in verse 24, Paul writes, put on the new self. The old life is the life that is dominated and controlled by sin. The person living the old life is helpless against the sinful temptations of the world and the sinful desires of their own hearts. The new life is the life that is controlled by Christ. The person living the new life has Christ at the very center of their lives, and they organize their lives around Christ such that he's honored and loved and magnified and worshipped. Living the old life leads to deeper and deeper darkness. Living the new life leads to greater and greater light. And so every Christian can say that they've received the gift of the new life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That being said, anyone who has tried to live the Christian life for more than five minutes realizes that even though they've been saved and justified and made new, that doesn't translate into a life that's char characterized by perfect holiness or perfect purity. They're still a sinner. Though gloriously and wondrously saved by Christ, Christians continue to struggle with temptation, impurity, and sin. That said, the Christian is more than able, by the grace of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, to grow in holiness, progressively. In chapter 4 and 5 of Ephesians, Paul is calling his fellow Christians, his fellow sinners, to live lives of greater and greater holiness, to take up this life of progressive uh, holiness. Paul begins chapter 4 of Ephesians by writing, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul is saying you're Christians, and now it's time that you begin to operate like Christians more and more. In chapter 4, verse 14, Paul urges us to attain to mature manhood, which is to say to become mature Christians, such that we are no longer tossed to and fro by silly doctrines and lies. Paul says in the next verse that we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So it's safe to say that Paul wants a pure church, but Paul understands that the process of becoming more pure, the process of growing in holiness, is a progressive thing. It takes time. We grow in holiness. And so Paul really wants a growing church and a maturing church and a church that looks more and more like Jesus as the days go by, because that's the kind of church which honors and glorifies Jesus. Paul gives us all sorts of um, practical advice in chapter 4 and 5. He tells us to give up um, falsehood, stealing, corrupt talk, grieving the Holy Spirit, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, idolatry, drunkenness, and debauchery. It's a rather long list. And then he tells us to take up truth-telling, honest work, generosity, words that build up, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, love and a life filled with joyous and happy singing. 
Now, a lot of us will read through that list, I certainly did, and I feel a bit of conviction. We see that there's places where we engage in what is sinful, and we see places where we fail to do what is right. None of us are as holy as we want to be. We cannot make ourselves holy. However, as I once heard John MacArthur say, growing in holiness is a matter of direction, not perfection. I thought that was easy to memorize. It's a matter of direction, not perfection. We can grow in holiness, and the importance is, is that that's the direction that we're heading in. But the question is, are there any principles? Is there, is there any help that we're offered in the scriptures which can help us live these lives of holiness, that can help us along the way as we're trying to grow in holiness? And as we come to this text for this, for this morning, we find four principles. If we want to grow in holiness, we need to rely on Christ's wisdom, Christ's will, Christ's pleasures, and Christ's authority. So Christ's will, sorry, Christ's wisdom, will, pleasures, and authority. Let us first consider Christ's wisdom. In verses 15 and 16 of our text, the Apostle Paul writes, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. This is Paul calling us Christians to live a life of wisdom. Now if you're looking for good practical wisdom, then you need to go to Christ. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is the greatest of all teachers, and he is the wisest of all teachers. If we want to grow in holiness, we need to be wise. And if we want to be wise, we need to go to Christ, who's the great source of wisdom. More specifically, we need to attend carefully to Christ's word. This past weekend, my wife, Tiara, read through the Gospel of Matthew. And as she read through the gospel, she took note of all the different commandments that Jesus gave in that gospel. And when she was done, she had a fairly uh, large list of the different things that Jesus said. And as she read that list out to me, I became overwhelmed. I was struck by just how many nuggets of pure wisdom Jesus offers us. How many nuggets of wisdom he offered us during his earthly ministry. I was familiar with many of the sayings and parables, but te tears jumped to my eyes as I heard them all re read out aloud. Jesus gives, him, gives us all the wisdom that we need to live a God-honoring and holy life. If, it is the wis if it's wisdom that you need, then go to Christ and go to Christ's Word. Take a morning aside and read through one of the Gospels. Read through a Gospel with a specific question in mind. What does Christ command? What does Christ teach me about prayer? What does Christ say about himself? It's a wonderful and beautiful exercise. Just take some time, take a Gospel, and, and ask that Gospel a question. All right, Jesus, I'm going to read the gospel. What do you say about um, money? Teach me what you have to say about money, and you'll find wonderful things. And so if you want to live the new life, if you want to grow in holiness, then you need wisdom. And so go to Christ, the source of all wisdom, and learn from him. Read his word. Second, if we're to live the new life, then we need to know the will of Christ. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 17 of our text, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Most people try to live their lives guided by their own will. They think, what do I want? What do I desire? What do I yearn for? To such people, the Bible says, don't be foolish. Understand what the word of the Lord is, or what the will of the Lord is. Now, some of you may think that that seems awfully grim. I need to live my life with someone else's will at the center of my life. That's, that's the thing. The Christians, Christians throughout history have always prayed must ultimately pray, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. But here's the thing, the Lord wills for us greater things than we ourselves will for ourselves. Christ is a greater gift giver than we ourselves are. To submit to the will of Christ is to, is to submit to the will of the Lord, who is far kinder than us, far more generous than us, far more joyous than us, and who can imagine far greater happiness than we can. The Apostle Paul writes, understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what tasks he has for you. Understand what goals he has for you. Understand what plans he has for you. Go to his word, all of his word, and learn the great story of redemption. Paul writes in his first letter to Timothy, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ's will is that we would be saved. Christ wills that we would inherit heaven and enjoy the nearer presence of God. 
Sometimes we look at the Christian life and we think, my goodness, this is too demanding. But when we understand the will of Christ for our lives, we find that the burden is lightened. Christ does not offer us drudgery and misery. To do the will of Christ is hard work, yes, but it is good work done for a good Lord. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through Christ. An heir through God, sorry. We are not called to serve God as slaves, but as sons, joyfully working for our beloved Father. And so if we want to grow in holiness, then we have to understand what the will of Jesus is. We have to understand what he wants for his dear friends and what sort of work he has for us to do. And so we go to the word and we ask the question, Dear Jesus, what is it that you will for me? And you will find that he wills wonderful and glorious things for you. He might will suffering for you, but suffering is worth it for such a good and wonderful Lord. And so if we're to make progress in the Christian life, then we need to understand the will of Christ. Third, we must come to know the pleasures of Christ if we are to grow in Christ. The Apostle Paul writes in verses 17 through 20 of our text, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk up with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the great mistakes that we make in the Christian life is thinking that holiness is simply a matter of getting rid of sin. We conceive of Christian growth as merely a negative affair in which the Christian is engaged in a lifelong process of denial, refusal, and struggling against temptation. We forget that where Christ asks us to give up certain practices, he offers us new and better practices. We find this wonderfully displayed in our text for today. Paul writes, give up on drunkenness and debauchery, get rid of all of that, but instead take up joyous, happy, communal singing. Right? He says, address one another with spiritual songs and hymns and, and songs. Many of you will have known the joy of singing together with other Christians. Since the beginning, we Christians have been a singing people. Wherever you find Christians, you'll find sweet and beautiful music. There are a few places in the world today where you can gather together with other folks and sing a few songs. Yet in churches across the world this morning, the faithful will gather together and sing. And the simple truth is that singing together is a pleasure, it's a joy. It calms the heart, it enlivens the soul, it helps us through suffering, it helps us express our gratitude and joy. When we come to Christ, he offers us a variety of what I have called pleasures, Christ's pleasures. Christ offers us prayer, praise, fellowship, Bible study, the sacraments, evangelism, and so on. In Ephesians 3 verse 8, Paul speaks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ can satisfy the human soul for all of eternity. And so the wisdom here is to not simply give up sin and leave a void in your life. To come back to our text this morning, it's not simply to give up drunken debauchery and then sit at home twiddling your thumbs. The point is to give up your life of drunken debauchery and instead gather together with your fellow Christians for a hymn sing or a prayer meeting. Spend a sweet hour in prayer with your Lord. Go to your Bible for an afternoon and search out all those sweet parts that you love to read. Read through a good book with some friends or go out for a coffee with a friend. If we want to grow in holiness, then we have to learn to replace the pleasures of this world with the pleasures of Christ. Fourth and finally, if we want to grow in holiness, then we have to recognize and appreciate the goodness of Christ's authority. When we call Jesus Lord, we recognize his authority and thereby recognize that it's appropriate to submit to that authority. In verse 21 of our text, Paul encourages Christians to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not only are we as Christians called to submit to Christ, but we are also called to submit to one another. Part of living a good, wise, fruitful life is understanding where we fit in to the structures of family, church, and society, and then faithfully submitting to what we ought to submit to and faithfully taking responsibility for that which we ought to take responsibility for. In short, Paul is saying, know what your role is and know it well. This is why Paul moves on to discussing how Christians ought to operate as wives and husbands, children and parents, 
and slaves and, and masters. If we look at Paul's teaching for wives and husbands, we see that Christ's will for marriage is that it would be a beautiful picture of the gospel. Wives are called to submit to their husbands, and husbands are called to love their wives. In so doing, Christian couples honor Christ and in a mysterious way display the love that the church has for Christ and that Christ has for the church. The Bible does not imagine a strictly egalitarian society which lacks any authority or structure. Though we are all image bearers of God, we are called to occupy a variety of roles. What is interesting to note is that those who are in authority are always expected to operate in a loving, self-sacrificing, and selfless way. The kings of Israel were expected to be self-sacrificing and humble men who were to submit themselves fully to the Lord. They were not to accrue for themselves horses or wives or vast fortunes. The same self-sacrificing humility was expected of the apostles who Christ put in authority over the church. The same sort of self-sacrificing loving leadership is expected of husbands. Paul says to husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What's interesting is that the instructions that Paul gives to husbands are three times longer than the instruction that Paul gives to wives. Christian husbands are to be a responsible, loving, self-sacrificing, holy, Christ-like sort of, sort of people. I would suggest to you this morning that many families have failed to flourish because husbands have not understood that the great responsibility that comes with their role is actually expected. Often we come to this text and we kind of get focused on what Paul says to wives, and we forget that Paul, what Paul says to husbands is three times longer remarkably onerous and calls them to be Christ-like in every way. And so here's the wisdom that Paul gives us for holy living. He says, um, go to Christ for wisdom. Go to Christ and discover what his will is. Go to Christ and figure out what pleasures he offers to Christians. And then go to Christ and learn to appreciate his authority. And learn uh, wh where you fit in and what your role is in society and how to do that in the most holy and effective way. And so what's common to all of these things, of course, is Christ. And what Paul ultimately teaches us about trying to live a holy life is that if we try to do it without Christ, we're not going to do it at all. In Christ, we're offered all the resources that we need to live a holy life. And so we ought to go to Christ in prayer. We ought to go to Christ by going to his word. And we ought to go to Christ by coming together as, as the church and worshiping him and learning from one another. So let's pray. Pray that Christ would teach us how to become holier and holier for our own joy and for his joy as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your son Jesus, who you sent into, into the world to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to be our teacher, to be our master. Lord, it's our desire that we would live a holy life. And so we pray that you would teach us time and time again to go to Christ and to find there the resources that we need to live a life faithful to him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth unity and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word, and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness, and so guide and direct their governors and rulers, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that your servant Elizabeth, our queen, and all who are set in authority under her, may impartially administer justice uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Give Amen. grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Foley, our primate, Charles, our diocesan, 
to Howard of St. Stephen the Martyr, Sean and Chuck of All Saints, Brian of St. Matthews, and to Donald, Marilyn, Colton, and Daryl, who serve and lead us at Good Samaritan, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word, and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, especially to those gathered here and those worshiping at home, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world and strengthen us to fulfill your great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those for whom we've been asked to pray. And we pray especially this morning for the nations of Afghanistan and Haiti. Lord, in your mercy. Remember before you, we remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God, our Heavenly Father, you have manifested your love by sending your only begotten Son into the world, that all may live through him. Pour out your Spirit on our diocese as we seek to launch a diocesan theological college that will train faithful ministers to fulfill his command to preach the gospel to all people. Raise up a new generation of pastors who will be sent forth as laborers into your harvest. Defend them in all dangers and temptations and hasten the time when the fullness of the Gentiles shall be gathered in and faithful Israel shall be saved. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church and so guide the minds of those who shall choose a bishop for our Diocese of the Anglican Network in Canada we may receive a faithful pastor who will preach the gospel, care for your people, equip us for ministry, and lead us forth in fulfillment of the Great Commission. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, and now and forever. Amen. And they gave everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone who his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering.
and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And on your honor be given. All who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and seek to live in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead the new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Maker and Judge of us all, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses, which we have committed by thought, for word, and deed, and in short time, majesty, provoking most justly your righteous anger against us. We are deeply sorry for these our transgressions, the burden of living for the one to be Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, <coughs> confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, and joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, <coughs> who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. So now, O merciful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy instituted, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Hail, <clears throat> precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for us. Therefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of your dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, your humble servants, Celebrate and make here before your divine majesty with these holy gifts the memorial your Son commanded us to make, remembering his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and his promise to come again. And we entirely desire your fatherly witness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving asking you to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of your passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake of this Holy Communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy because of our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, Yet we ask you to accept this duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. We do not presume to come to the O merciful Lord, trust in our own righteousness, but in your own and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to have what you promise to do. But you are our same Lord, who is prepared to always have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to be blessed with your spirit. 
Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us.
our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us, and that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs to the hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue with that holy fellowship, and do all the good works you have prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen.